Hey everyone, I'm Anna from Vana. Um, bit of background on me, I first got into crypto through mining. I was really interested in currency, um, like just general currency. I had a picture of Janet Yellen, who's chair of the Fed, in my high school bedroom and then like worked with the Fed and was just very interested. Got to MIT, started learning about decentralized currencies and like mining ETH back in 2015 and then got interested in AI through some research I was doing at CSAIL, which is MIT's AI lab back in 2017. Um, at Vano, we're building user-owned AI through user-owned data. You might know us through some of the data DAOs on the platform, like the Reddit data DAO, but today I'll be talking about kind of broadly what user-owned AI is and then Vano's role um, in building it out. So first, an important distinction I think is between kind of like centralized AI, open source AI, and user-owned AI. A lot of people are familiar with centralized AI. This is, think like Anthropic, OpenAI, what you do is you train, oh shoot, there we go. Yeah, let me know if the slides do something. I, I don't speak Chinese, I don't even know what that says. So, um, yeah, centralized AI, basically you train a model and then you keep the model weights private. And what that allows you to do is monetize it, right? Because AI models are really expensive to build. It can cost 10 to 100 million dollars. I think a few years out, it's honestly probably gonna cost like a billion dollars to train some of these frontier foundation models. So you do need some way to be able to monetize that massive capital expenditure that goes towards models. The, at the other end of the extreme, we have open source AI, which is monetizable, right? You can charge people, or it's not monetizable because the weights are just open, but it is controlled by many, which is good because then you're able to have kind of a, a system of many people innovating and fine tuning models contributing back to them. Um, so with Vana, what we're building is user-owned AI where you have the best of both worlds, right? So you're able to have the models be monetizable and controlled by many. And the key to make this possible is privacy. You need to be able to keep the data or the model weights private in order to own something, right? Someone doesn't want to pay you money for something if it's publicly available on the internet. That just like doesn't really make sense. So that's why privacy is so important to making user-owned AI work. Uh, foundation models, which is just a, a word for the really powerful AI models that are kind of the, at the base of um, many of these different AI s systems, are becoming both a source of truth and economic power, right? OpenAI hit recently like $3.4 billion in revenue. And there's a lot of kind of economic shift that's coming, right? I think there's some talk of, hey, is AI going to take all of our jobs? And it's sort of trained on our data. Um, and so, yeah, looking for kind of, yeah, ways to decentralize that super centralized uh, model provider. Uh, ultimately, AI models are only good as good as their training data. So this is the training data from GPT-3. Um, the main source here, Common Crawl, that's the data set if you just like take a bot and have it take, like scrape the whole public internet. Um, so it's... Everything, you know when you go on a Google search page and you can see like the titles and stuff, it's everything that shows up there, but nothing that's private and behind a walled garden, right? So any of your emails, any of your private documents, messages, even a platform that requires sign-on to access like Facebook or Instagram, that's not included in these public data sets. Um, and people estimate that less than 0.1% of the internet is publicly scrapable. Right, so it's a really small subset of the internet that we're training on today. We're running into what AI researchers today call the data wall. And what the data wall is, is that we've run out of data to train AI models on. So here you can see as the models have gotten bigger, so, oh, you know, let me see if this is updating. There we go, sorry about that. So GPT-3 is trained on like a few hundred million token. Now we've really scaled that up. So Llama 3 is trained on 15 trillion tokens. It's not a crypto token, it's just a word. So I should really, yeah, in crypto context, swap that out. But 15 trillion words. And that's pretty much all the data that's available on the public internet, right? So if you want to improve these AI models, you need some way to get more data and actually continue to train them for a longer period of time. Companies have realized, hey, my data is really valuable for training AI models because it's the key ingredient to make them better. And they've started charging a lot of money for it, right? So Reddit is earning $200 million from selling data. A Apple is buying news data for $50 million. And you sort of see this trend where 
companies that have the data, like Reddit, Stack Overflow, they actually change their policies to make it harder for other people to access the data because then they can like earn more money from that data, right? It's kind of the rational economic incentive to do that. So one group still has access to their data, which is like all of us as users. A lot of people don't realize, but you legally own all of your data. It's sort of like when you park your car in a parking lot. The parking lot doesn't own your car just because you parked it there. And it's the same way with a platform. You retain full legal ownership of your data and you're granting them a very permissive license to use it, right? And so there's sort of this opportunity where you can have each user export their data from across platforms and actually build a bigger data set than any single company has access to. Two examples of this, if anyone uses an Alexa, you can export all your Alexa data and like every single audio message you've ever, or audio recording you've ever interacted with Alexa for. Um, it's kind of a creepy experience, but I think like worth doing. Um, the other one is if you use Instagram, you can see not just all of your posts and your messages, but also the labels that Instagram put on you. One label that Instagram put on me is stress but not depressed. And it, it's actually like they have to give it to you and it's interesting to do. So to do that, just go look up your GDPR or CCPA export. That's the data regulation that kind of lets you access it. Um, and then you can see all that data. So users have a lot of data. Here is the 15 trillion tokens. Oh, just waiting for the slide to switch. There we go. So uh, 15 trillion tokens, that's what leading models are trained on today. If you have um, 100 million users, which sounds like a lot, we're 1% of the way there at Vana, but we're still not at 100 million, um, export data from five platforms, you get to 450 trillion tokens, which is just a huge amount of data. Um, I'll note too, it's not just about quantity, it's also about quality, I'll cover that later. Um, but yeah, it's 30 times as much. It's really a huge kind of improvement on data available today. Um, and then on top of that, if you have incentives to sort of encourage users to share data, you can start to have markets that form where people are recording more data and actually trying to sort of like get more data generated for the purposes of training models. Um, the other piece of creating AI models is compute. Um, sorry, just sort of, uh, I think it takes a second for the slides. Um, so actually doing this math was really helpful because I used to be very skeptical of the distributed GPU projects because my view was like, hey, when you train an AI model, it's really helpful to have compute co-located where you have all your different GPUs together. And so I just did some like rough benchmarks on um, how much compute power do all Ethereum miners have in the proof of work days relative to what was used to train like GPT-4. And they actually have like 50 times more compute than like the giant data centers that Big Tech has. The reason why this is interesting is even if you're taking like a 10x hit in terms of performance, you can still train much better models. So what this looks like in a Vana context is everyone has their data, trains a small piece of the model on their data, and then contributes that back. There are some open research questions to actually make that technically possible. Once you have the model weights, right, of sort of like one of our guiding use cases is try to beat GPT-6 in terms of performance, right, with 100 million users contributing their data. Then you have collective gov governance and ownership, which says, hey, um, users get paid when the model's used or even paid proportionally to how much their data improved the model. Um, you can also have the collective set usage rules. So things like uh, censorship, what should be allowed, what shouldn't be allowed. I don't know if folks use Claude at all, but often when I'm using Claude and I ask it something crypto related, it says like, I can't help you with this crypto question because cryptocurrency is unethical if you've run into that. And so, yeah, we can build a better model that doesn't have that fit in. Um, or if, if some subset wants that censorship, that's fine too. So I think a lot of people assume that AI foundation models must come out of monopolies and we just have to rely on kind of big tech to open source models, hope Meta keeps on doing it. But it, it's actually really in the hands of users, right? If you have enough people contributing data and contributing compute, you can create better AI models. And user-owned AI really offers this alternative path where you have many users contribute their data and actually create better AI models. 
So what we're doing at Vana is building user-owned AI through user-owned data. What that means is we're basically having users all contribute their data. Let me see. Okay. So uh, we're having users, oh yeah, maybe just two t key technical concepts. One is non-custodial data. What non-custodial data means is that you can manage access to your data just like your funds. Um, the other important piece is proof of contribution. What that allows for is for people to pool data together, right? So if we all got together and said, hey, we're all gonna contribute our email data or our writing data together, you have the risk that one person could pretend to be 100 people, all put their data in, or contribute kind of malicious data of some kind. And so, yeah, that's where proof of contribution with Vana comes in. Um, one of the biggest projects on Vana is the Reddit data DAO, which saw 140,000 real Reddit users join. I emphasize real Reddit users because there were nearly a million people who tried to join, but only 140,000 passed proof of contribution, which is basically measuring is your data meaningfully contributing to the data DAO? Is your account old enough? Do you have enough comments? It was also based on how much karma you had. And now um, they've actually trained the first user-owned LLM, which because it's trained on Reddit data is just good at shitposting, but is kind of the first of its kind as a user-owned AI model. There are now a whole bunch of different data DAOs on Vana that are pooling AI training data. So I'll call out a few. Valara is a Twitter data DAO. Um, the LinkedIn data DAO actually recently raised a half million dollars. So some of these projects are actually getting venture funded as standalone data DAOs built on Vana. And each data DAO has its own token, which governs that specific data set. Uh, and then the top 16 data DAOs earn a share of emissions. Um, it's sort of a similar structure to BitTensor's subnets where because folks are onboarding data onto the network, they're rewarded with a, a share of block rewards. Uh, quick note on Vana's architecture. So the data liquidity layer is where all the data DAOs live. That's where the 16 data DAOs are. That's all written back on chain. Vana it is an, a layer one that's EVM compatible and works with private data. But the way you can think of it is really just a network of data DAOs where you can access many users' data in the same way that you can have someone bring their funds with you to a, a DAP. So yeah, get involved with user-owned AI. Um, if you're a builder, start a data DAO, the top 16 data DAOs uh, earn emissions. Um, this, we just have kind of a test net right now. There are eight or so data DAOs in um, each cohort, um, and eight of them will launch on mainnet alongside us. Um, but yeah, you can go to build.vana.com to learn more if you're looking to build a data DAO. If you're a protocol and you want to access data, like data to train on, um, data to just personalize your application, um, it's a fully permissionless network, so you can just integrate it there, put up, uh, if you want the data DAO data, you have to put a proposal to the different DAOs. Um, or if you're a user, you can participate in a data pre-mine. So uh, what you can do there is basically register and say, hey, this is my Instagram account I own or my LinkedIn account I own. Um, you're not yet contributing your data because mainnet isn't live, so you're not financially rewarded for your data on testnet, but you can sort of get that early slot. Um, here's our Twitter, at with Vana. Happy to answer any questions. <laughs>